Hey folks, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, where we talk about the Beatles on all of our shows, and it could be any any part of their history, their music, their times together as a band, the solo years. We will get more into the news here on this channel, and I want to thank all of you who have been joining me here and uh, subscribing to the channel, the new and the old. And if you ever have any suggestions for something that you'd like to see on this channel, you can always write to me privately at everylittlething at att.net. One of the ideas that I've brought to this channel a few times that I'd like to do more often is what I call a young blood show. And that's when I have several guests on and they're 40 and under. So we can ask questions to those guests and learn about them and how they feel about the Beatles history and their legacy from the perspective of a young mind. We can go right into their brains, pick at it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and just um, I just find that really interesting because the way young people feel may be very different from the first generation and second generations of fans. It's kind of interesting to know how younger people feel about the Beatles, how they discover their music, how they feel about their solo careers. And I like to mix up the questions every time I do this, but I'd like to welcome three guests here to the show, two of which are fresh faces to this channel. And one of them uh, we had on a little more than a year ago, Jonathan Pushkar, who is a power pop artist, and he's on Gem Records. He had this album out when we interviewed him called Compositions. Almost all original songs from Jonathan, except for one obscure tune you might have heard of called Junior's Farm. And he also had the original drummer on Junior's Farm playing with him on that song. And that was a great experience, I'm sure. We talked about that at length on the channel. He's also been on uh, a few of the tribute CDs on Gem Records for John Lennon. I got the John Lennon one right here, where he covers uh, Starting Over and I Call Your Name. And uh, welcome, Jonathan Pushkar, back to our channel. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invite and uh, glad to be representing the young generation, as the monkeys might say. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you've been up to lately and uh, are you working on any new album of any kind or what? Yeah, things have been great, and thanks again for having me on the show tonight. Uh, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, USA, so Music City, there's always music cooking here. Um, and last year, I put out several singles, um, a couple that tied in with superhero movies, because that's my other love. It's Beatles and superheroes. So uh, last year, I put out a song called No Way Home, themed around the Spider-Man movie, and I put out a oh, song wow. called Love and Thunder, themed around the Thor movie and right now as we speak I have a movie be a, a song being mixed uh about the new Ant-Man movie so that will be out here in about two weeks just about so that's going to be super fun it's a very different musical direction for me it's very zombies meets the kinks so something a little different a little fresh and uh super excited about that and then later in 2022 gonna be chipping away the stone at album number three so getting ready and revving up the machine again. Very cool. You couldn't have picked a better time to be into superheroes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, I'm you know, telling you, man. Every time those... I turn around, there's a new show or movie to watch, so it's great. That's right. All right. I forgot to mention Jeff Britton, the drummer on Junior's Farm, who was on. And you also had uh, John Rajavi on your, your, your CD. He's of the Weaklings and the band Liverpool that plays at the Fest for Beatles fans. So... You know, uh, and we're going to have a weakling on the next show that we're doing. Oh, awesome. As well. The other cool thing to mention about that Junior's Farm, people can go watch our interview on the channel here together if they want to learn everything. But uh, the bass player, his name's Dan Ely, and uh, he right. played a Rickenbacker bass that he gave to Paul while Paul was here in Tennessee in 1974. So the bass that's on our Junior's Farm was played by Paul, which is just crazy. He must hug that bass every day then. Oh, it's a great story. You should have him on the show someday. I think I will. You know, let's do it. Uh, let's, but hey, let's, let's talk about our it. other guests. Yes. Who else okay. is here tonight? We have Jack Lawless. And Jack is 
uh, a fellow podcaster. He hosts a Beatles podcast called Here, There, and Everywhere. And last I checked, you have 41 shows already? Is it? Yes. Yeah, I think 41 just came out today. Um, but it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, what you do on, on your podcast is you do a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews. And I'm really impressed with the list of people that you have on there. I'm just going to mention a few, uh, a couple of which have been on my channel. Um, Lori Kay, Lori Jacobson, David Bennett. I want to get him on my channel. That dude yeah. is amazing. He's he's someone that um, has his own channel, and it's all about music theory, what uh, certain artists have done that's innovative, certain chord progressions that are interesting. He goes really into depth about it, but it's really it's also for the lay person who may not know a lot about uh, music theory and all. But he's brilliant. How did you get David? Yeah, David's a super nice guy, super knowledgeable about everything when it comes to music theory, especially the Beatles, too. Um, it's great having him on. But I reached out to him on Instagram. Okay. Uh, my whole show kind of stems from my Beatles Earth social media, I guess, network. Um, so we have a Twitter page, Instagram page. And um, I reach out through there. And I was lucky enough for him to respond and say, I'd love to be on. So it cool. kind of worked out. All right. I got to listen to that one. David Wilde, you've had on. I've had him on my channel. Jude Kessler's great. I've known her for many years. Rob Sheffield. Um, also, Don Most. Yeah. Did yeah, you have Don a, a happy is... day with him or what? Yeah. So uh -huh. that one, that one I've been trying to, I've been trying to get him on for a while. Um, I've, I've always wanted to know more about the time when John Lennon visited the uh, mm. set of happy days in the 70s. Right. Um, so he accepted the invitation to come on the podcast, which was fantastic. And he told the story, um, which was always, you know, hearsay until that moment. I believe Henry Winkler commented on it once or twice, but uh, Don really paints the full picture um, in that uh, episode, which was great to hear. Really cool. But one thing I want to bring up about your podcast for people who just, if you're looking at it right now, you interview people of all different types of occupations. It's not just musicians. How do you decide, like you have a wrestler on one of your shows, you wouldn't tend to think I'm going to interview a wrestler and talk about the Beatles. Yeah. So how do you decide these guests who, who you think would be interesting? How do you know they're even Beatles fans? Um, so that's a good question. Um, I interview people who I want to talk to and who I want to have a discussion with, mm -hmm. whether it be about the Beatles or just about life, because conversations that start with the Beatles typically um, evolve into larger conversation conversations about philosophy and life and um, the intersection of music and uh, life decisions. So I think one of the coolest things ever is, you know, nearly everyone I know, uh, loves the Beatles and if you love the Beatles there has to be some aspect of your life that was influenced by them um, so that's really what I set out to to find when I do each episode um, I do look for diversity because I think um, one of the coolest things is seeing how the Beatles have stretched across um, so many people's lives no matter where they're from or what they do um, even if they've never touched an instrument before in their life Mm, very interesting. I must make a confession here on this show, but um, you might have heard me mention a record store that I used to work at. This is back from 1980 through 83. And I had a guest on uh, this channel, Ed Ryan, who's one of my best friends in life. I came to know him through working at this record store. And when I first started doing my Beatles show on college radio, he became my co-host. And while working at that record store, I met your dad, <laughs> Frank Lawless, and uh, we were both customer service representatives, helping all the customers find records there in the store. And uh, Frank and I always talked about music. I'm sure we talked about the Beatles a lot. It's a great guy. It's the most happy fella I ever worked with. <laughs> <laughs> so Frank, if you're watching, you did a good job here with him. All right. <laughs> Finally, we have uh, Jensen Tag. Jensen's from England, and he's a musician. He plays guitar. 
He also told me he plays ukulele, maybe because little, of George little, Harrison. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. A little bit of ukulele, not uh, not massive, but yeah, it, it was directly from George Harrison, though. You're right, yeah. Okay. Hey, you know Greg Hawks from the Cars. Um, he was very much influenced by the fact that George Harrison played ukulele, and so he learned the ukulele and put out the whole CD of Beatles songs on ukulele. So you never know. George picking it up could get other people to do the same thing. Absolutely, um, yeah. But you, uh, you've you written your own music and I, you sent me a couple of samples of them, which I would kind of classify as like uh, country, current country mixed with rock. Um, yeah. Would you say that? Yeah, that's accurate? I would, I would say that, yeah. A lot of um, uh, it's like Indie, indie people say I'm country and country people say I'm indie. So I'm, I'm happy to be somewhere in the middle. Yeah, but it's really good stuff. And uh, for all my guests, there's going to be links in the description box where you can check out their work. Check out Jack's podcast, Jonathan's music and Jensen's music. And uh, Jensen is also uh, a big fan of the shows that I co-host, Things We Said Today and Talk More Talk, and also Two Legs, which is hosted by Tom Hunyadi and Andy Nichols, and Tom is in the Talk More Talk podcast. So he knows about the whole web <laughs> uh, of my shows here. Um, also, Robert Rodriguez's show, I think you told me, something about the Beatles you listened to as well. So yeah, very cool. How do we find the time to just constantly <laughs> listen to Beatles <laughs> podcasts? And pretty soon you'll be listening to Jack's show. I'm sure. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so I have three questions to pose to each of you. And so um, the first question will be, they're all really interesting. Um, what was the most fascinating year when the Beatles were together? And why do you feel that way? If you want, you can even go before they were famous, when they were in the Quarrymen, whatever interests you the most whether it be the music, all their activities of that year. To me, it's all fascinating. How do you pick one? So let me start with, how about, we'll go with Jensen first. Okay. <laughs> um, so well, my, my first thought was when, when you posed the question, I was thinking more of a, just solely a musical perspective. And, I, and my first thought went to 1967. Um, <clears throat> um, but then I thought, uh, I changed tact and then and I went with 1964. Um, also to give a bit of early beat was a bit of recognition too because I, I know I, I am in that camp as well that gravitates towards the later stuff. Mm. But um, 1964 was such a busy year for them. It was they were under immense pressure and um, how they stayed so cool and themselves like throughout is fascinating to me. Um, you got the um, American Invasion, um, Hard Day's Night film, Hard Day's Night album. Um, John Lennon's book came out in that same year, so that was going mm -hmm. on at the same time. Um, the World Tour, um, Bob Dylan introduces them to cannabis, which then later has a effect around Rubber Soul time and the writing. Um, uh, Beatles for Sale album, and then they finished the year um, with the Christmas shows in the Hammersmith Odeon. Um, but watching the um, the the first U.S. visit, the Maisel's documentary, mm -hmm. right. seeing, seeing seeing all that, which I also think is like a sort of a real life hard day's night. There's a few similarities in there. There's it's like it has got quite a claustroph claustrophobic feel to it. Sure. Um, there's a train scene which is like similar. There's and uh, I do wonder if they ever saw footage of that to um, and if that affected any of the the writing process. I know Alan Owen hung out with them at the end of 1963 and he must have been a very perceptive guy to pick up um their way if you like right. um, and and because a lot the, they say a lot of the stuff you think are ad libs in the film are, are not they're they're written by him but um <clears throat> seeing uh the press conference when they um in february 7th i think it is when they land sure yeah um just see like the pandemonium of it there's the guy there i forget his name telling everyone to shut up shouting at them because <laughs> there's so much commotion yeah. um uh but they're i think their charm and their humor are on full display there um like with the just batting off the questions like 
like nothing. Like they're not phased by it at all. I think Paul Paul's the only one who looks slightly nervous to me. But um you can you can see you can tell how excited they are. Um like and all the quips like form another group and be managers and all that all that sort of thing. It's just fascinating to watch them. Um I think you can see their excitement. It brings out the best in their humour and their charm. And this is obviously obviously still early enough where everything is new and exciting for them, where it starts to wane a little bit as um, time is going on. Then obviously there's the Ed Sullivan show, 73 million people that you hear so much about and that the, mm-hmm. the, the crime rate fell. And, right. Uh, all that. Um, <laughs> watching the watching Washington show, um, I love that, especially watching Ringo play. Um, you can tell he's he looks and feels like he's on on top of the world, and I can't think of another time where he's on film where he's that animated behind his behind his drum kit. Especially that side shot of the stage where he's like really going for it. In um, I saw her standing there. I think it is where uh-huh. he's really yeah. pounding, really yeah. pounding. It's like you know, sort of what I talk, what I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, and they come back from the the US, and three days later they begin recording. A Hard Day's Night LP, mm-hmm. uh, um, which is crazy to think. They just had no no rest throughout that year at yep. all. Um, obviously, I know they, they had recorded Can't Buy Me Love in um, Paris in January. Um, mm-hmm. And I think there was a few overdubs when they got back. But um, uh, yeah, for me, A Hard Day's Night is their first masterpiece, I think. Like, I, lo- like, I don't think there's a duff song on there they hardly ever wrote a duff song anyway um it's the first all originals album the only album that's all lennon mccartney um and yeah it's the first to feature the 12 string rickenbacker that george um right. that george had and it sounds like influenced like the the birds and the loving spoonful and and bands like that um and obviously that famous chord that out fox's guitarists still now trying to figure out what it is i know george says it's an f add nine but i know there's a d in the bass and also there's a piano that's about as much i know what's what's going on in right in that um and yeah and then they have the the uh world tour obviously ringo um misses the first part of that um that we know about um but uh, but just before that we they've got the film which um i think it's the perfect timing for, for that for the film to be made at the time it was made they've just conquered america if you like so um like they were known to everyone by this point and loved by everyone few ex- exceptions of course like but um but mostly everyone loved them from children to the elderly um, well i think that that certainly the elderly part happened a little bit later i would think as their music oh, became really sophisticated you know when yeah. a song like yesterday came out there were older people who were noticing that. Yeah. But um, yeah. Please. I'm talking more because uh, you, you can see on the um, Hard Day's Night um, book um, where there's an elderly lady talking to Paul, I think it is. Mm-hmm. And you can just tell that she's infatuated with him. Yeah. And and rarely you see that with mm-hmm. um, other bands that are around at the time. So like, are they, even at that point, that early in their career, they're crossing over generations even then um obviously the title um i'm sure everyone knows the story about the ringo malapropism um, mm-hmm. and it was first used in the sad michael poem which was That's as true. i mentioned before with the um in his own right was going at the same time as they were recording the film so it was a current topic and walter shenton the producer came up in conversation obviously said oh that would be a good title for the film so it's already used in the um sad michael piece in for in his own right this is true though ringo gets all the credit for it yeah you know <laughs> but you know you can make a case for every single year the Beatles were together and that's the tough thing about all this but what what you just illustrated there was how busy the beatles were in that year mm. and that was the year when they exploded all around the world and you know there are times when i look at 63 I mean, 63 was the year that they really broke in the UK. And between 63 and 64, they barely had time to breathe. Mm. You know, whether it was recording songs, being on the BBC, doing shows, doing the tours, recording their music, making the movies, 
certainly 64 with a hard day's night and, and help in 65. So yeah, it, the, the fact that they were able to put out the kind of music that they did when they were that busy in that top quality. And there's something I, I, I like what you said about A Hard Day's Night, although, you know, if, if you're like me and you love just about everything the Beatles ever did, that uh, Please Please Me is a fascinating album. And with the Beatles, you'll see a big sign of growth there. But A Hard Day's Night is just so fresh when mm -hmm. you listen to it now. And um, the fact that it was the first all original album. Yeah, uh, it just has so much energy to it that album but uh you know i love all of it <laughs> yeah it's, but, it's uh, like you said though you can't you can literally choose in any year um from at least 1960 on um yeah to, to talk about it's, it's like any like every part of the every section of the beatles is fascinating in, yeah. in some way in some ways i feel like i've been spoiled because when all this happened in 64 i was four and a half and I heard all the music, but I didn't fully experience it like a teenager would, mm -hmm. you know, but I still heard all the music and I grew to love it. And I loved it even more, even after the Beatles broke up, you grow to appreciate it even more and more. But I, I lived through that and I lived through all the solo years and all the great solo music. So I feel really lucky, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. at a time when all that music was was played so much on the radio, too. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure we all feel really jealous as well. <laughs> <laughs> all right jack how about you so i have to agree with uh jensen 1964 and 1967 are definitely top two contenders for the most fascinating like 1967 right off the bat is iconic for sergeant pepper and magical mystery tour and just the the peak of counterculture the beatles were the symbol of you know they were the harbinger of what was to come with uh, countercultures and hippies and um, all that stuff. But I'm going to have to say it's 1968 as the most fascinating year when it comes to their creativity, because although 1967, I'll, I'll say 1967 is the most fascinating on paper, but really they really come into their own for me in 68 when they go to India right off the bat, starting in February, um, the amount of songs they write when they're meditating, when they are, they quit substances for however long they're there for. And they're just trying to figure out life. And the amount of that's, you know, um, Blackbird, Juliet, some of their most beautiful songs come out of that era. And even songs that later appear on Abbey Road, the, I believe like most of the second side came from snippets of songs that were written during that time um so that's what i would say is the most fascinating for sure because you also have hey jude coming out that year in revolution songs that are some of their most iconic works and timeless works as well um 67 some songs on magical mystery tour could you know you listen to it you listen to blue jay way and it, as fascinating as that song is, I don't think it would hold up in contemporary radio stations as Hey Jude would. Um, and then, of course, 68 is also the year that John starts hanging out with Yoko more and more. Uh, I believe Paul started seeing Linda as well. Um, so 67. Well, I mean, first meeting Linda in 67. Yeah. Um, but, I, I, you know, I would go with 68. Hmm. Okay. Well, it's I'm not gonna argue with, with right. anyone here. Or we could. Like, we could. You know, <laughs> we, but um, you know, I, I can certainly see a, a great topic which you can have a thousand shows on is uh, you know, when was the Beatles at their peak and um their creative peak. And you can argue this point over and over again. Um with all the praise that Revolver has gotten in the last couple of decades. It was so much of a creative leap going from Rubber Soul to Revolver. And then in 67, to do both Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour, not to mention what a lot of people may consider, a lot of them do consider, to be their greatest single ever with Penny Lane, Strawberry Fields Forever. So if you look at that period as being their peak, then 
would 68 be it's never a disappointment but would it be you know coming down from that but it was a different approach because they wanted the music to be more more raw not as produced like sergeant pepper was um although i would never say sergeant pepper is overproduced but uh yeah the, the whole thing about the beatles was constant change and um the fact that they were as prolific as they were in 68 yeah a couple of the songs on side two of abbey road were from 68 but um yeah i mean I, the white album is my favorite beatle album at the moment <laughs> yeah it could always change but uh because they were so diverse on that album and they had been since the very beginning but every range of styles is there on that record you know from the acoustic stuff that they did like blackbird and julia to um reggae on oh blood dio blood da, to heavy metal in um helter skelter a great orchestral ballad like good night you know there's so much there and then you got revolution number nine in the middle of all that so you know they were really stretching boundaries there for what a band could do so yeah i 60 it's a great year jack <laughs> yeah yeah i do like it i think a lot of modern music wouldn't be possible if not for the songs on the white album hmm. okay jonathan i'm gonna kind of guess with your haircut <laughs> that maybe maybe it's 65 66 somewhere in that neighborhood yeah um <laughs> with a lot of bands not just the beatles mm-hmm have this saying and it kind of jars people when i say it but i have to explain it that i like bands less as time goes on so like for example the rolling stones the earlier in the catalog the more i like it the beach boys the earlier in the catalog the more i like it the same is true for almost every band elvis the beatles huh. i like the earlier first half of most bands career more than later stuff and um I think if you listen to my musical output, that maybe isn't quite as surprising because a lot of my stuff is very chimey guitars, 12 string guitars. And uh, my sweet spot for music falls in like that very late 1963 till like December 31st, 1965. Like that is my sweet spot of music. Um, and I love a lot of 50s pop rock, rockabilly stuff, which again is kind of upbeat, fast kind of jubilant music so um i like to start with that as a preface before i break down what my favorite beetle year is in terms mm -hmm. of the context of the question so uh i think jensen made a great argument for 64 and jack for 68 um i go 1965 and the reason is i think 1965 is just one of the greatest years for pop music in general but also for the beatles uh, of course, our two big flagship albums that year are Help and Rubber Soul, which to me is like the last of the mop top era for Help in the beginning of kind of the more artistic era, if you will, with Rubber mm -hmm. Soul. But both albums to me are like the perfect bookends for the two eras, and they really go up against each other very well. You can finish with Dizzy Miss Lizzy and start with Drive My Car and not really miss too much of a beat. Whereas I hear a lot of Beatles scholars talk about Rubber Soul and Revolver kind of being the sister albums. But I think that there's a much bigger jump creatively between Rubber Soul and Revolver oh, yeah. in a very positive direction than there is Help and Rubber Soul. So to me, I really love that they're so close and there is such a big jump from one sound to another between those albums. Um, Going back to what Jensen said a lot about 64, uh, I think 65, you know, a lot of those same points. But in 65, you kind of have the Beatles, like, disprove the sophomore slump theory, if you will. Because mm -hmm. for the majority of the world, especially North America, you know, they didn't know who the Beatles were prior to 64. So you have such a home run year in 64 with Hard Day's Night, The Washington Show, the first U.S. tour, the world tour, all of these things. And then 65 proves that the mop tops and the, it isn't just a fad. They could keep it going and they made it 
not just another year, but for all the years to come after that, even to present day, you know, where there are no Beatles actively making music. Um, so I really like the resilience of 1965. The fact that the Beatles came back arguably bigger and better. Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of home runs in 64, but it's hard to say that Rubber Soul isn't a top three Beatles album artistically. I mean, a lot of people My are going to throw it in there. So uh, I love that. And then one other note that I'll say about 65 is because I live at the bottom of the music nerd rabbit hole, a lot of my friends that also live in these dark dwelling parts, I ask them what the best <laughs> single release ever is, meaning A side, B side, you know, like there's some crazy, crazy uh, Elvis ones like Hound Dog and Don't Be Cruel. Oh my gosh, how is that not one of the best, you know, so there's so many great A sides, B sides. And uh, me personally, I think I get around and don't worry, baby, from the Beach Boys is just unbeatably good. That's just, that's my number one, probably then Hound Dog, Don't Be Cruel. But in context of the Beatles, you've got We Can Work It Out and Day Tripper, which is just, oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> what a beautiful pair of songs uh, with kind of the angst of Day Tripper and the hopefulness of We Can Work It Out. Mm. Both have the perfect harmony blend. Uh, I think Ringo in particular really gets to shine on Day Tripper with a lot of those fills at the mm -hmm. fade out that are what no other drummer at the time would have done. Um, you know, of course, the guitar riffs, We Can Work It Out, you've got the harmonies. I think that that's just such a... A uh, perfect pair of Beatles songs that if you had to describe the band in 145, if Aliens came to Earth and you had 145, to <laughs> me, that's the one I pick because even though I know the critical argument for Penny Lane, Strawberry Fields, I mean, that's another one that's just, I don't know how you pick two better songs to be on the two sides of a 45, but I don't think that it represents the entire breadth of what the Beatles were in the way that Day Tripper and We Can Work It Out does. We Can Work It Out has a lot of the acoustic elements that we hear as the Beatles go on into the White Album, even into like two of us off of Let It Be to some extent. And Day Tripper carries all of the harmonies, the guitar driven stuff from earlier before. So to me, it's the perfect 45 that combines all eras of past and late Beatles, early late Beatles, if you will. And uh, that's why I throw my hat in the ring for 65. I just think it's got a lot going for it in all those directions. Okay. Well, you explained it well. I just try to, I, I don't know if I can understand as, as the music got more, I'm not going to say creative because it always was creative from the very beginning, but as it got more complicated and more innovative, you were... I don't want to say turned off from it, but you didn't like it as much. You like the more simplicity of the earlier times. Well, it's like if you and I go to Cold Stone Creamery, right? Ice cream. They could serve me any kind of ice cream and I'm going to be into it. But there are just certain combinations of flavors that I like better than others. And right. uh, it's just that 65 and earlier stuff that really gets me going. You know, I hear uh, Buddy Holly, Eddie Cochran, things like that. And I just like feel this fire in my chest of how excited I get. And I just don't feel that quite as much with Beatles stuff from 66 onward as I do 65 backwards. So, you know, it's just my personal taste. It's just what I always gravitate towards. So. Okay. But there are times like when you, when you take something like Lady Madonna, which is obviously Fats Domino influenced, that sure. kind of thing. Or back in the USSR, where you hear the Beach Boys influence. Yep. Surely you must have enjoyed those because it was hearkening back a little bit to an earlier time. Absolutely. And it's not to say I don't like that stuff. It's just preferential order. And I guess if it helps solidify my case at all, when I saw Get Back on the IMAX screen here in Nashville, I cried four times. So, I mean, you know, the later stuff still has an effect on me. Mm -hmm. Uh it just it's the earlier stuff that gets me going you know i just i absolutely love it hey i'm always defending the earlier stuff and i shouldn't have to defend it <laughs> hey you know, i'm right but, there uh, on the front lines with you man you know i i cringe every single time i keep hearing that certain music is dated and i bring this up all the time in, in my podcast um and what determines whether or not music is dated or not and why should that even matter 
it shouldn't matter. It's like like fifth. Like if you're going to use the word dated, like uh -huh. any any music of its time is like that's that far that that long ago is going to be dated. But it, I think well, it's more. I don't, of a I, don't, I don't know about that, Jensen, because there are certain. Are using are past... using inverted commas, but it's it's like more more of the word like of its time, shall we say? rather than dated it i think it just comes to a preference of whether okay. you like that sound like i know the 80s always gets a bit of a bashing for the production style right. and the argument they use is oh that sounds dated to me but they'll love chuck berry and eddie cochran and little richard from the 50s which yeah. still sounds dated but it's it's of its time but they just like that sound so i, I don't think dated is necessarily the right word to use because it has negative connotations to it but if you said of its time but I don't like the production style of that time. That's that's where I come from. That's where I come at it from anyway. Okay. With, um, the whole dated dated debate. Well, you know, it's a sore subject with me. Yeah. <laughs> you probably know that, Jensen. But, uh, <laughs> you know, most of the music that's ever been recorded doesn't sound like it was recorded today. So are uh, you going to ignore that? I wouldn't think less of any music like people say the early Beatles stuff, please, please me with the Beatles is of its time or dated or whatever you want to call it. But it's not going to stop me from loving it the same way I always am. No. Sergeant Pepper, not. they say, is of its time. I don't think less of it because, you know, yes, when I hear it, I think of 1967. It automatically screams 1967 to me. But I love it just the same. Sure. The same way I'd love 50s rock and roll just the same. Hmm. Well, I think it's interesting that music has this transcendence that I'm going to say a lot of other media doesn't, um, you know, take a, any movie from the 60s and it feels like it's from the 60s. Hmm. When you get into the 70s and especially the 80s onward, they tend to age pretty well, like Back to the Future, obviously set in 1985, but hmm. just as loved by today's generation as it was when it came out that right. year. But My favorite film? Yeah, I mean, it's up there for me, too. You look at, you know, The Shining out of the 70s. Definitely feels like a 70s movie, but, you know, it's also transcendent that all generations love it. Uh, so you can't say that with 60s, 50s, and especially earlier than that film. And I'm just going to use that example. Otherwise, we're going to start talking about interpretive art and dance and blah, blah, yeah. blah. But the point is, is music has this transcendent nature that, you know, there are people that are graduating high school today that love 1940s radio hits. You know, what is it about music that uh, transverses generations and preferences in ways that other media doesn't? Mm. Um, and I think if you look at it from that perspective, it really helps transcend the Beatles getting back on conversation. It's like, sure, you can say, please, please me is of its time, but I mean, it's only five years removed from revolution and revolutions generally beloved. Hey Jude, maybe a better example. Everybody loves Hey Jude. Timeless song. It's gonna mm -hmm. outlive all of us. But it's only five years removed. You know, five years ago it was 2017, or well, the year just turned over. So you know what I mean. Yeah. But but when people say when people say music is of its time, it's it's to me it's like cutting it down. You know, it's like yeah. saying it doesn't survive today. And that's ridiculous. It really oh, is. No, but, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't want to come across like I was putting it down. I, like, no, I I'm not of... saying you in particular. I'm just saying in general, whenever I have conversations on my podcast shows. No, because uh, when I said like of its time, but it's like, but I love that time. So it's, yeah. like, it's <laughs> like, like you said, like you're saying with Sergeant Pepper, like it does scream 1967. Yeah. But I, I love a lot of music from 1967. So like, right. it's a positive, in that respect, it's, a po it's positive that it's of its time because I love that sound. Hmm. Um, so yeah okay um, our second question of the four solo Beatles whose music has been the most um, satisfying or gratifying for each of you obviously it's not all that fair in this case since John's life was cut short that he has the smallest catalog obviously but if his music does it for you more than the others then that's fine just what I want to know is from each of the three of you, which one of the of the uh, four Beatles have you found to be, you know, um, the most satisfying with their output? 
Obviously, there's a big advantage in Paul and Ringo outliving John and George, so their catalogs are bigger. But really, it has more to do with music that you just generally enjoy the most between the four of them. So this time, I think we'll start with Jack. So uh, I just want to start by saying I love all of their solo work um, very much. And I listen to each one's solo work uh, during different phases of my life. Hmm. But overall, I find Paul McCartney's solo career to be the most, um, at least my, I find the most favorite songs I have in Paul's solo careers um, than John, George, or Ringo's. Um, unfortunately, you know, John and George's solo careers were obviously shorter. Um, but while they were still working, I feel like their creative process, their creative processes were more distracted or disrupted than Paul's was during his solo period. So for example, John had a five-year hiatus from 75 to 1980, um, which is, uh, you know, needed personally, uh, for John, but, and again, it's, you know, it's unfair advantage, but, um, he just didn't have that amount of output as Paul did. Uh, maybe if he, you know, I don't know if he would have, uh, if we were to hear the songs he made during that time, I don't actually don't even think he picked up a guitar, but that's uh, not true. <laughs> I, 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 read, not true. I read no. a quote of him saying like he had a, you know, acoustic guitar hanging above his bed um, that he hasn't picked up in five years when he start, first started making double fantasy. So I think he was just talking about that one guitar, but. Uh, well, yeah, I he, think he, he exaggerated there. There's enough evidence through the Lost Land Tapes radio series and what's been bootlegged. And we know that many of the songs that ended up on Double Fantasy were songs that he started writing a year or two before then. And they just kind of evolved from yeah. different um, song, what they called prototypes. You know, he combined certain, um, you know, song fragments together and formed certain songs. Some of them were brand new for Double Fantasy and for Milk and Honey, but you know, quite a number of them were songs he it took a year or two to fully finish. But he played the guitar and he played the piano. But I, I honestly think when John said that, he probably was saying, for the most part, I didn't pick up the guitar for the last five years. Um, sure, but he, yeah. I think he was writing when he felt like writing. And when he wanted to put something down and record it so he wouldn't forget it later. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think people, you know, they, they could write all the time too, just in their heads, just observing. I mm. think that constitutes his writing as well. And some of John's songs, like um, even the ones that came out later on an anthology, like real love. I know that went through a series of evolutions. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite songs by John as well. But, you know, uh, getting back to the question, I think Paul McCartney, just his first couple of solo albums with solo albums and with Wings, um, McCartney, you have Ram, uh, Band on the Run, Red Rose Speedway. Um, those albums for me are just eight, and a, eight out of 10 and above when it comes to ratings. Um, and... Uh, George had All Things Must Pass, which I really, really loved. Loved that one. Um, but then I don't think I could say the same for a George album until uh, 33 and a Third. Mm. Um, that's my next favorite of his. And then I loved all the ones after that. So what was it that you didn't like about the albums in between All Things Must Pass and 33 and a Third? I just <laughs> want to ask because... Yeah, my favorite solo album, my favorite album from anybody is Living in the Material World. You know, I love the spiritual side of George Harrison and the very deeply personal songs that are on there, even more personal to me than what was on All Things Must Pass. But um, yeah, I, I think George, in a way, he he experienced fulfillment with all the success that he had, both with the Beatles and the early part of his solo career. And I think he, he reached a point where he's just putting out music to please himself. And if it sold well, fine. I don't think he was all that concerned about having a blockbuster album. But 33 and a Third is a great album. But what was it in between that you didn't care for? Just curious. Um, 
so I think the songs on the albums in between are great songs, but I personally, I just can't connect to them the way that I can connect to his songs from the later seventies that are a little bit more not um, like you said, he was just kind of having fun with the songs instead mm. of uh, the person, personal stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, that's when I feel like I could relate to George the most like cracker box, Cracker Box Palace is mm. a great song. Um, got my mind set on you. The cover is ph- phenomenal too. Yeah. But with Paul, I mean, we're talking about now 53 years of solo music. There's so much there to explore. You, do you basically like mainly the 70s, Paul, or most of it? Yeah. So I, um, I'll have to say I'll, I'll break his solo work up into segments and I, I'll say I love 70s Paul. That's the best Paul for me. Next is the 90s and early 2000s Paul. So from Flaming Pie to Chaos and Creation, um, all the way up to the Fireman. I love all that stuff as well. But the 80s, again, I, I can't connect to a lot of his songs from there. Hmm. And and why would that be? Um, I, I feel like... Uh, it's just i i think he could do better um lyrically hmm. um i think he could do better creatively uh than what he put out in the 80s no more lonely nights is a great song i'll uh-huh. give him that but um you know i just uh if, if he had john still there i think he, that would have pushed him to push himself a little more in the creative direction okay well you and I have got to do a show together on the eighties with Paul. Sure. We are we are on both opposite sides there, I tell you. <laughs> to me, Tug of War, Press to Play, and Flowers in the Dirt are three of his greatest albums. So um and uh I love this collaboration with Eric Stewart on Press to Play and with Elvis Costello later on. So yeah, but that's fine. That's oh it's great music. It's great music overall, but I hold them I hold him such highly on a pedestal where I I, I want um, to connect, to be able to connect the dots. But like you said, we, we definitely should uh, discuss more about that. Okay. Get your boxing gloves ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, how about you? Yeah. Similarly, Paul comes out on top, but I do want to touch on all three solo Beatle careers so that when I explain why Paul comes out on top, it makes a little bit more sense. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, Ringo really has some strong material in the 70s with Photograph, It Don't Come Easy, I'm the Greatest. Of course, the three I just mentioned being Beatle collaborations, if you know who's on it and who wrote what. But, Mm. I mean, It Don't Come Easy is such a monster, monster song. And the way I look at pop music, because pop music is mainly what I like. Um, I like hard rock. I like, like, you know, Aerosmith uh, getting into Black Sabbath. Like, I do like a little harder stuff, but pop music is what I really, really love. Hmm. So when I sit down to write music, of course, you know, when music comes out now, it's not on a 45, but I think what's the spirit that goes into a song that makes you have to get up and put the needle on that song again and just Mm -hmm. listen to it over and over and over again. And I think that to some extent, that's a little bit of a lost uh, art form. You know, you look at really, really early stuff like, you know, even like the locomotion. I don't know why that's coming to mind, but uh-huh. think about if you hadn't heard any music after the locomotion, how a song like that just would knock you over and you just want to listen to it again and again and again. Hmm. So jumping to the Beatles solo careers, I think stuff like Photograph, It Don't Come Easy from Ringo captures that element so well. It's pretty rare I listen to It Don't Come Easy one time. I always hit repeat and got to listen mm-hmm. to it again because it's so good. So I love that early solo career stuff from Ringo, even Buku of Blues recorded right here in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Pretty different, interesting take for a Beatle kind of coming out of the uh, Beatle complex of where do you go with your career now? Pretty interesting. Um, But then he'd do another one. I wish he'd do another (laughs) country album. He would crush it. Come to Nashville, Ringo. I'll, I'll (laughs) do whatever you need on said album. Um, but that being said, uh, Ringo's early 2000s stuff, the Mark Hudson era, really strong stuff, too. Absolutely. Uh, 
you know, weight of the world. I'll just use that as the example. That is one of the most Beatles sounding solo Beatles songs there is with that mm -hmm. great guitar riff. Da -da 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 -da. So good. The harmony stacks, uh, even just the songwriting on it is so good. And I think, unfortunately, it gets overlooked because it's a Ringo song. If Paul and Ringo did Weight of the World together, the world would have stopped turning for a minute when that <laughs> hit radio waves because it's that good. It's so beatle -y. So Ringo, his career uh, even racked my brain. Great song, kind of uh -huh. out of nowhere in the discography. Like if you put it on a map, that's like a spike kind of in a barren mm. land of Ringo singles, but really strong stuff. Um, touching on the George solo stuff very quickly. I mean, it's hard to get past the ethereal feeling of uh, All Things Must Pass. I mean, every song on that just has this misty moodiness in mm. between it, maybe with the exception of the Apple Jam side of the album. Yeah. But, um, you know, as far as the singer songwriter stuff, I mean, it's just incredible. And to have Ringo and Jim Keltner on that album, keeping the backbeat is just mm. out Jim of this Keltner's world. not on it. Jim Keltner's not on that. He's but, not on but, it? No, Alan White is on it. Ah, okay. I thought Jim was. No. Either way, no. still a great yeah, sure. section and everything. Yeah. And uh, folks, that's why you uh, got to do your research before you come on a Ken Michael <laughs> show. Uh, but the George stuff is phenomenal too. I think it might be cheating to throw this in there, but the Traveling Wilbury stuff is on yeah. another plane of songwriting. I understand that that's not 100% George, but you know, you take something like Headed for the Light. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's that. just, it's from another universe. It's so good. It's so good. So George's solo career I, has a lot more songs that I like in it. Probably if we took a tally of songs that I love, George's would come out on top. Uh, John, unfortunately, kind of falls toward the back for me. Just not quite as interesting without Paul from a production standpoint. That's just my take. I really love Imagine. Uh, I like Plastic Ono Band. And I like a lot of the rock and roll album. But outside of that, the production value uh, of Paul's stuff, solo-wise, and the John and Paul Beatles stuff together, I think John was so uh, stronger from a production side when Paul was in the room. Just my take. Probably saying a lot of things tonight that are going to get me hate, but <laughs> hey, gotta no. be myself. So <laughs> that leaves us with Paul. Paul comes out on top for me, and I have a deeper appreciation for Paul's music, understanding the history behind it. In that, you know, I was born in '95, so basically everything in the Beatles catalog, including anthology, was pretty much done by the time I had cognizance of the world, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, in my world, all the best to the Paul McCartney, you know, compilation, mm -hmm. which was pretty much the compilation for all those years until you got like Wingspan, and which is maybe a right. little bit more collective of Paul. But regardless, um, that was Paul's solo career to me, all the best. And obviously it really is all the best of Paul's you know years up to that point but when you look into the history books and realize mm -hmm. that Paul did not necessarily come out of the gate swinging in the way that the other three Beatles did uh the other three Beatles to varying degrees kind of found success with what they were putting out and yeah of course Paul's stuff all hit the top 40 I'm not saying he was unsuccessful but comparatively Paul did not come out of the gate swinging with major, major hits like Band on the Run till 73. Everything up till that point, you know, was kind of to some extent in John's shadow of how strong John came out of the gate. Hmm. And I might argue that once Band on the Run comes out, the tables completely flip and Paul just owns the 70s from Band on the Run till the end of the 70s, I would argue. Um, but I really like that element that, you know, today, if you ask most working songwriters, musicians, oh, you know, who do you think is the best songwriter of all time? If you ask a hundred, you might get a majority that say Paul McCartney. And that's not unthinkable. Um, and I love that history has been good to Paul in that respect, but I love that he overcame the little bit of uh, rockiness, I might say, that the 70s began with for him. And Paul had so much identity tied up in the Beatles that I think it maybe took Paul a minute to figure out who am I without the Beatles? 
And McCartney is a great exercise of that and a strong exercise, I might say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Man, We Was Lonely, of course, Teddy Boy being recycled from the Beatle days. Maybe I'm amazed, of course. But it does take Paul a minute to find his footing. And again, going into the history books with Band on the Run, a time when Wings, to that point, he had two members leave the band. Right. And Paul is back to basics again, just arguably three, four years after the end of the Beatles. And I just love that spirit of tenacity of Paul rolling up his sleeves and being like, you know what? All good. We're going to do this, the three of us. So much so that Paul and Keith Moon are hanging out at one point after Band on the Run. And Keith Moon asks who played drums on the titular song. And Paul said, oh, yeah, it was me, love. And <laughs> Keith Moon doesn't believe him. I just love that uh, tenacity and that get up and go spirit. And that drives me, uh, you know, when sometimes I feel like, oh, man, you know, I'm in a writing drought or whatever. I just think of that pre-Band on the Run 1972, 73, Paul was like, nope, I've got this. I've got it in me. Just got to keep chugging forward and do this. And, uh, you know, I hope to write songs that are half of Band on the Run songs someday. But that being said, I just love that tenacity that Paul has. And it inspires me on so many levels as a creative. So Paul gets my vote. Yeah. Have you read the the new book on McCartney, The McCartney Legacy? Yet, I have not. One? No, I'm okay. an audiobook guy, so I got to I don't know if it's out on audiobook yet, but that well, would be my go. You will love it because of the fact of all that Paul went through during that period through through Ben on the Run and all the struggles that he had and he always had the Beatles in the back of his mind and the lawsuits and and um how do you how do you break this band to the world? How do you, you know, how do you start from square one all over again? But um, it should always be pointed out that there's a difference between commercial success and criti critical success. And Paul always had commercial success. I mean, McCartney went to number one. Ram went to number two. Wildlife went to number 10. Red Rose Speedway went to number one. And he had number one singles before Ben on the Run. He had Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey went to number one. He had My Love, which was number one for four weeks. So he had a lot of commercial success, but he was always chasing after, at least this is what's in the book, critical success. And right. he was always trying to figure out what do the critics want from me? You know, when they didn't like how the first McCartney album came out, that it appeared to be a lot of half-finished songs. And uh, it's a homespun album, not really produced all that much. Then he went the opposite direction with Ram. And he still got criticized for him. And then he went opposite again. <laughs> and he did Wildlife. And he did, you know, a very raw album. This is a band starting out, being pure, being honest. Songs recorded very quickly. Critics didn't like that. You know, he was always chasing after the critics. Red Rose Speedway, he was starting to pick things up. And then by Band on the Run, everybody loved him. But and I think a thing had... to point it. I think a thing to point out, too, is that, yes, of course, there were uh, Beatles critics that hit songs, you know, here and there and getting banned by the BBC on a couple occasions and things like yeah. that. But generally speaking, painting with a wide brush, it's the first time Paul had been critically panned. And so to do that on your own and not have three other guys that you could turn to and say, hey, what do you think about this? Yeah. You know, I it just speaks to that tenacity that I love so much about Paul in that era. So, so good. So it has as much to do with his tenacity and his perseverance than the music. Yep. Yeah. And all the best, by the way, is mainly the singles, which I wouldn't always say is his best. <laughs> you know, there's oh, so yeah, many there's... great album cuts that he's done, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 1985, oh, yes. I mean, that alone... It's just such a monster song. We'll be here all day if we talk about the album cuts, but, uh, okay. you know, I love it. We'll save it for another show. Sounds good. <laughs> Jensen, it's your turn. Um, yeah, so growing up, I was a massive Lennon fan. So I mm -hmm. devoured, once I'd heard everything the Beatles had ever done, I um, devoured Lennon's um, solo catalog, as here's my favorite. So I'm talking about maybe nine years uh -huh. of age it was like a, it was my dad's record collection he had plastic ono band i wasn't allowed to touch that one for some reason i wasn't allowed to play that one at 10 years old but he it's gave profanity me, in it that's why 
<laughs> I don't think it was that. I think because yeah. that was his favourite. So yeah. he, he didn't want me to ruin it, <laughs> ruin the vinyl. Oh, okay. So, um, <laughs> uh, so, but he had um, Imagine, obviously, and uh, the Rock and Roll album, Mind Games, Wars and Bridge. He had them all, actually. So I managed to de devour them. But in uh, recent years, and I say recent, probably the last 10 years, um, I'd have to go I'd have to go with McCartney um I, I do agree a lot with what Jack was saying regarding the George Harrison um discography for but mine's after living in material living in the material world the the one it, but then I do come back in at 33 and a third um I do, I do love that um mm -hmm. from then on um uh but yeah it, it has to be McCartney really for the for the so just because of the sheer volume of it compared to compared to the others um but yeah I, otherwise i'd just be sort of jumping on what uh jonathan was saying really about it but yeah I, and i have to go with mccartney as well mm. do you find that he's been consistently strong or does he just do you find that he's inconsistent does he <laughs> go in peaks and valleys or are you just overall just very yeah. satisfied with most of what he's done yeah, I love seventies McCartney as well. Again, I agree. I, I agree with a lot of what Jack was saying. With um, the eighties taking a bit of a dip for me, with being able to connect with it. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I didn't want to have to say that because I know that's your favorite. That's era. fine. You could say whatever <laughs> you want. Um, but yeah, and I, but yeah, the Ram is my favorite McCartney album. Um, but which I was a, a late comer to, um, because. Uh, my cousin asked me if I'd heard it and I was like, no, I've never heard that one. And he's like, oh, that's an album dreams are made of. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, well, got to hear it then. And I was like, what is this? I've ne Why have I never heard this? And then I went in more of a deep dive with the wing stuff, with um, Red uh, Red Rose Speedway I wasn't very familiar with. So it just opened up a whole new world of McCartney to discover for me at the time. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, we don't know what... Um, John Lennon would have done had he lived past 1980, but um, or what direction he would have gone in. Um, uh, but yeah, McCartney, McCartney for me. Hmm. It's pretty amazing the love for Ram these days and how much it's appreciated to the point where a lot of fans are rating it their favorite of his. Mm. Not bad on the run, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's very interesting to me. Uh, the appreciation, the growing appreciation of his pre-band on the run stuff, especially. Yeah, it's like when you hear quotes from, like, because what you're saying about his um, uh, the success at the time. Obviously, like you said, he had commercial success, but with <laughs> like even he's like even Ringo. I don't know if it's because what was going on at the time, but there's that quote from him that says, "I don't think there's a single song on man like <laughs> that." He likes that. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> that's well, you know, baffling uh, to me. We all have different opinions. You know, mm. George Harrison liked that that would be something. Yeah. Which, you know, I love the feel and the vibe of the song. It's not much of a composition. I can't mm. believe that he would pick that one out <laughs> out of the yeah. party album as one that he likes a lot. But that's he has a right to say what he wants to say. But we don't have to agree with the Beatles. Yeah. Say about <laughs> each other. Yeah. But uh, how is it? What was it about the '80s that you didn't feel you connected with, with Paul? Just curious. Um, a, a very, a very similar thing to what um Jack uh Jack was saying. Like maybe um maybe lyrically, um there is obviously songs that I do I do like. There's um, uh, say 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 I think is a brilliant song. Hmm. Um, that's that's one of my favorite solo. Although it's a duet with Michael Jackson, it's still one of my favorite um solo, solo songs of his um but um yeah it's just the connectivity really i can't quite put my finger on it um but it comes back uh for me around flaming pie era yeah and so and good. then and uh up to chaos and creation and memory almost and well since then really from flaming pie onwards i, I love pretty much everything he's he's put out since then i can't knock any of it yeah well, I've talked a bit about how there are certain fans that like the more um, pure McCartney, if you want to call it that, sound. Yeah. Something that's closer to what he did in the 70s. And that's why the more simple production 
something mm -hmm. like Flaming Pie, Chaos and Creation is more to your liking. You probably would be, I don't want to say turned off, but you wouldn't have favored when he, when a producer has a lot of influence, another producer on his music. Although saying that, uh, I think Nigel Godrich with um, Chaos and Creation did have a lot of, um, maybe not influence, but it, it's like he, like there's that where Paul McCartney says he refused to let me play songs that he didn't like, which was mm. very cheeky of him, he says. And I think it's, I think it was good to, at that time to have, um, to have Paul take so, someone else's um, criticism on board, really, because you do hear all these stories he doesn't like, the whole issue with Elvis Costello, um, making suggestions, and he did not like that. Um, and then for someone who was a, a lot um, younger than him, with Nigel Godrich as a producer, making suggestions and saying, no, we're not doing that. Like I think he had to fight to get um, Riding to Vanity Fair on the album, which I think is in a is a good thing mm. really, that he's fighting for his songs and he has to justify it not only to himself but to other people as well why he's put in why it should go on the album I think is a good thing um because obviously with someone at the stature of Paul McCartney is going to be surrounded by yes men right so, so to have someone like Nigel Godrich at the time and saying that's that's not good enough you can do better than that is um I think was a good good thing for him at the time and all the better for it that chaos and creation is my second favorite um McCartney record wow Okay. See, that's the thing. It's got to be a difficult job for anyone to produce Paul, considering, yeah. you know, look at his track record. Yeah. How do you argue with someone who's had <laughs> that much success? Yeah. How do you say, no, you should do it this way? It's yeah. not easy. It's not easy. And and I don't know if the producers are always right anyway. I not tend always. to like I tend to like Paul's sensibility, what he knows works with his music. Mm -hmm. You know? He did say that when he was um, writing That Day Is Done with Elvis Costello, that he heard a more human league sound on the song and Elvis Costello didn't want that. Mm. And I think <laughs> that they made the right decision on the record, but I haven't heard it that way as yeah. if it was a human league production. Maybe it would have worked. I don't know. Sure. <laughs> anyway, let's get to our last question. Speaking of Paul, boy, this is going to be difficult. <laughs> I love throwing difficult questions at you guys. What is the best song Paul McCartney has written or co-written um, in this century from 2000 up till today? Could be anything, could be a single, could be an album cut. What one stands out that you would say is the best song from the last 22, 23 uh, years? So, Let's see, who should I start with this time? Who didn't I start with before? Was it? I don't no. think I've Jonathan. started yet. Okay, you'll, yeah. you'll start this time. Okay. So <clears throat> I know that the question is one song and I have three that come to mind, but all for <laughs> very specific purposes. So okay. do you want me to say all three? Do you want me to tell you the purpose and then you pick which one you want to hear? Well, of the three, is there one that stands out more than the others? Is there one no, that they you all would... stand out for different reasons? <laughs> so it, now, it makes now Jack's going to have five, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one that stands out because the first time I heard it, radio, no less. Mm. I just thought, whoa, whoa, this sounds like it could have been on a Beatles album, which uh -huh. I absolutely love that. There's another one here that I think is just an exemplary uh, output from Paul in his solo career that just such a beautiful song. Uh, it's probably the most beautiful song in my opinion, post 2000. And then there's another one that I talked a couple of times in my previous segments about like puts that fire in me that I just love it. It just drives me. And there's one that does that. So I don't know which one you want me to go with. Go with all of them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go in order. So the one that knocked me out was <laughs> new off of, that okay. album of the same title my dad my grandfather and i were driving through kind of rural pennsylvania i grew up in pa and we were antique shopping and uh i guess we had i don't even know if the beatles channel was a thing at the time might have mm -hmm. been little stevens underground garage or something but it was a serious xm channel and they played whatever song before 
and then with no introduction had that harpsichord bow no 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 yeah and then when paul's kind of falsetto we driving downward piano came on i was like oh my gosh this sounds like it could have been on magical mystery tour with hmm. the exception of paul sounding his age that could have been on magical mystery tour and especially when you get to the end the do, 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 do. right I can hear John and George doing those. So that just sounded so Beatle-y to me in a way that no other post Beatles song has ever hit me before. That like, wow, that sounds so Beatle-y. So New gets my vote for that. Then just, we talked just about- Just so you know, just so you know, first time I heard New, it made me think of Penny Lane. Yeah. yeah. Or um, maybe Got to Get You Into My Life, but definitely the bounciness of it, you know, um, so poppy. Just- Descending yeah. bass line as well in the in the keys. Yeah. That's quite Penny Lane-esque. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So good. good so I love that. As far as beautiful song, uh, I remember the first time I heard this never happened before. Totally mm. knocked me out. Uh, it feels like it's from a different part of Paul's post-2000 creative brain that really touches back on that. Um, no more Lonely Nights kind of thing, but more modern my love but not as slow and you know kind of ballady it just has this ethereal element to it that is hard to put a thumbprint on uh that i just really love it stands out in paul's entire catalog to me but especially Mm -hmm. in the post 2000 catalog for the context of this question and then the one that just drives me also off the new album is turned out i love turned out with the call and answer harmonies back and Uh forth Uh, I really love that, well, before I say what I love about it, Paul has been with his current live band longer than any other band he's ever been with. And with that being said, especially off of the live album, Good Evening New York City, I think that his current band has a very distinct voice and thumbprint, the way that they, the five of them tie together. It's very, very unique, and I think Turned Out is a great example of showing all of them with uh, some of the harmony vocals you hear there. Abe is driving on the drums, but maybe not as forward as, like, Save Us, using the same album as an example. Uh It just fits in that groove so well, and it has this summery feel to it that I get when I listen to the Help album. I don't think that Turned Out would have fit on Help. I'm not saying that, Hmm. but there's a emotion a uh, feeling, a warmth that comes from that song that I don't get from anything else in Paul's catalog quite the way I do from Turned Out. And the guitars are just so tonally dialed in. It's just such a great pop rock song. So those are my three. Okay, great choices. When I hear Turned Out, I think of Wings. To me, it's yeah. a very Wings-ish track, <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, it has some Junior's Farm elements in there too, like kind of that drum fill before you drop back into a verse almost like downshifting in a car you know right it's uh it's got a great feel to it. it's so expertly produced and written so i love yeah. it yeah and i gotta say i i just absolutely love the way new ends with those harmonies and i kind of yeah. wish when paul did it live he cut that out they didn't yeah, do man. the harmonies there but on record it sounds great very so cool good. way to end that song all right, Jack, you are next. So, um, like Jonathan, uh, it's hard to narrow it down to just one for me, so I'm going to mention two. <laughs> um, okay. Jenny Wren from 2005's yes. Chaos and Creation. All yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. One of my so all-time good. favorite songs. Um, and I don't just like it because it was like a wow moment from a, a Paul McCartney post, you know, the – He's not making music for money at this point by any means. Uh, so it was really nice to hear um, uh, almost like a cousin to Eleanor Rigby in a way, sonically. Um, that really um, stood out to me. I really love that song. Um, also, Sing the Changes by yeah, so Fireman. I think it was 2007 or eight. Um, yeah. That was the first contemporary paul mccartney song that i was around for like i was actively tuned in to the music on the radio stations at this point in my life um and when this song was released 
I had an iPod and I bought it on iTunes. Um, it was the first song that I bought on iTunes and um, it was just something I listened to on my way to middle school. Um, and I thought in hindsight, that's really cool because um, needless to say, I wasn't around for most of Paul's career, but to have him come out with a song that a 12 year old can listen to um, by choice um, without really having a bigger idea of who this artist is. Yeah, he was a Beatle for sure, but um, without experiencing how big that word is, Beatle, um, mm. it, it's a really cool concept. So those are my two songs that um, really stand out to me and that I will always love. So when you heard Sing the Changes the first time, did you know it was Paul on the record? Um, Yes, I did. Um, mm. Yeah, because... I think my dad sent that to me and said, you would like this song. This is by Paul McCartney. What I didn't understand is why didn't it say by Paul McCartney and said, you know, the fireman. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was just a really cool song. He sounded young. He sounded fresh. He sounded energetic. It was really artistic. And um, I, I really liked that. Yeah. For those where it matters, whether it sounds contemporary, that song sounds very contemporary. Yeah, it really even does. now it does. Would you guys want to see him work with youth some more? Yeah, I, I loved Electric Arguments. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think that would be great. I think Paul um, would would love that too. In a picture Julian Lennon posted um, the other month, I think they ran into each other at Heathrow Airport. They did, and uh, Paul was showing you know that he had uh, Jude's new album on on his iPhone, but on the bottom, you can see he's listening to that album, Electric Arguments on Spotify. Um, so <laughs> he obviously goes back and listens to it from time to time. Didn't notice that. Yeah, yeah, you gotta zoom oh, in. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I love in studying somebody like McCartney is that there's so many different ways that he's recorded. And in the case of Electric Arguments, he has said that he would go into the studio one day a month and just go in there with youth and create something out of thin air. And whatever they have is what they've got, you know, from scratch. So that's what those songs are. So there's a real spontaneity to it. And the production really does sound like it, you know, is very now, very contemporary. But yeah, I'd love to see more of that stuff. He kind of took that same approach with uh, Cut Me Some Slack with the surviving right. members of Nirvana. Just love that showing up. Yep up with this random cigar box guitar and <laughs> oh yeah dave let's write a song yeah you know and then that's what you get it's like holy cow it's helter skelter because he, he yeah. wanted to do um he wanted to dave Grohl wanted him to do uh long tall sally again didn't he and he's like why don't we just write a new one okay <laughs> yeah i didn't, I didn't Paul, hear that Paul, it's it's an interview with dave Grohl where paul where he, go, he basically goes to paul and said oh i really want to do long tall sally and paul goes well i've already done it let's do let's do something right. else uh, let's write one and then yeah. so that's what they can. That's on that is on my list of honorable mentions as well. I think you've mentioned nearly every every song I was gonna mention as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Jack, thumbs up for Jenny Wren. That would be like probably my top two for me in in uh in this century. I think the end of the end is an absolute masterpiece. Um it's tough to listen to because it deals with how he wants the world to respond to his death when it happens more like an Irish wake where everybody's celebrating his life, but the lyrics in there are just so amazing. And the melody's great. And it's Paul on a piano and not much else. And he whistles in it, but the <laughs> Jenny Wren is so gorgeous. And he said it was daughter of Blackbird. And there's that, that very kind of foreign sounding instrument that's used in there. That's very haunting. It's not a clarinet. It's a, there's another name, but I can't remember off the top of my head. The solo is a clarinet. There might be a flugelhorn in there as well, or something like that in the background. Okay, but I know there's a different name, but oh, perhaps I'll just get it out. What's yeah. that? I said perhaps. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's a different instrument altogether, but um, it's a gorgeous tune, Jenny Wren. Mm. Definitely so one good. of his best. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Jensen. Well, I've got nothing left to say. 
after <laughs> <laughs> it's like the only one you hadn't mentioned was the end of the end I had up there, which Ken just mentioned. <laughs> I'm sorry. Which, that's fine. It's like it's um exactly what I was gonna say. Yeah, it's 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 a very like I I haven't heard Paul McCartney talk about his own mortality in in even interviews or in song that much. Yeah. Uh, so to hear that was a bit of an eye opener. Um, uh, and uh, never thought something that personal would he would come from him lyrically without being a little bit disguised. But to say basically when. When I die, I want songs to be sung, you know, things, mm. things like that, addressing that. So that was an honourable mention for me. Um, new as well, everything Jonathan said, I had that down as an on honourable mention. Um, oh, actually, um, oh, cut me, cut me some slack I had down. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> but more more recently, no, Nothing for Free on a bonus track on um, wow. yeah. Egypt Station. That's a number one hit if I've ever, ever heard one. It's like, why wasn't that on the, on the record? It's like I, it's it's catchy as hell, and I, I just love that song. I couldn't believe I couldn't believe it when I heard it that it wasn't on the album. Yeah, so, what well, and I just love it. But as mentioned a lot, I did go with Jenny Wren as my <laughs> favorite. Um, uh, when I I just learned to play Blackbird on guitar around two thousand five when that album came out. Mm -hmm. So when I heard Jenny Wren, I was like, I have to, I have to learn that now like and uh, obviously I, I learned it i like how the guitar is double tracked but it's you can tell it's double tracked but it's still tight um okay. i don't think it's automatic double tracking to my to my ears um i do think he actually manually double tracked that guitar which is um amazing timing uh to double track that um the i always thought it was a clarinet i may be wrong but i think his vocal delivery on that song it's got a bit of a whisper to it like quite breathy and airy mm. which almost mimics the sound of that instrument i find you can hear the wind coming out of whatever mm. the instrument i thought it was a clarinet but to me it sounds like he's mimicking the the sound of that instrument where it's got he's, he's letting quite a lot of air out when he's singing okay. um, but like you say a, a gorgeous song um and yeah that's my my favorite in i think it's miraculous century. that he did that song live on tour you know oh, and you? jenny wren yes oh. yeah um only once like after the album came out and he's hitting some pretty high notes there mm. you know on that um so have you mastered jenny wren i've not played it probably since then though because I, I it's, it's funny thing even though i'm a musician yeah I, there's not many beatles songs or solo beatles songs that i've actually learned i don't know if it's because i don't want to destroy the magic of it or what i don't know <laughs> but there's, there's very few there's actually very few songs that i can play all the way through blackbird is probably the one i can i could do um okay offhand. all right anything you guys want to add about your own comments of what suggestions uh you all made or we're all fine you've put together a great group this has been awesome chatting with you guys you know what's yeah, really it. It, it's pretty remarkable you know i just I see who's available and you never know when, when the same group of people almost always have the same songs picked <laughs> and you you don't plan that, you know, it, it must say how strong these songs really are for them to yeah. connect with, with each of you. I'm so glad to hear Jenny Wren being picked because, you know, and I, I, I always feel like I'm in a minority when it comes to the end of the end. But um, I think I've turned a lot of people on to that song because I think it's one of the greatest songs he's ever done, including mm -hmm. Beatles. Um, not one he's ever going to do in concert <laughs> for the mm -hmm. subject matter. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it definitely is a masterpiece. But That's anyway, right. um, I'm going to include, like I said earlier, the links to get in touch with all three of you guys if people want to know the music that you've created uh jensen and jonathan and your podcast jack and um love to have you on again whether it's this combo or other combos or solo <laughs> you know solo careers are great i always emphasize that <laughs> and paul's is the best <laughs> <laughs> thank you ken and it was very nice meeting you jensen and jonathan as well yeah you too yeah great you to too. meet you gents
Yeah. All right. You too. Loved it. So thanks to you guys for being here and thanks to all of you for watching. And uh, I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.